Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today, we are continuing our ongoing coverage of the Russian-Ukrainian War. And uh, yes, I am uh, back from Silicon Valley, uh, back in the uh, back in the United States of America. Uh, I have departed the uh, Republic of Pacifica, aka the Republic of California, aka the former West Coast of the United States. Anyway, back to the video at hand. Well, as I talked about over the last uh, several weeks, we had been looking at the prospect of a possible uh, Russian uh, offensive operation uh, coming out of Belarus towards Kiev. Uh, the Ukrainians have been discussing this, as have other analysts. Uh, I have been uh, saying that uh, I did not feel that the force construct uh, that was inside of Belarus was of uh, su sufficient force uh, to make a move towards Kiev. It would have to be uh, rapidly and massively expanded. And that hasn't been done. And now we're hearing that quite possibly the Russians are moving forces uh, that were training in Belarus uh, to other areas of the uh, ongoing war, such as the uh, Donbass or uh, now uh, the area near Zaporizhia is, uh, is starting to, uh, to heat up. But we had also uh, talked about a major Russian offensive operation starting late winter, early spring. Now, it does appear that the Russians are launching limited offensive operations in the south in the direction towards Zaporizhia. It does not appear that the Russians right now are in a position to launch major offensive operations uh, designed to completely cut off, say, the Dnepr River, or operations directed at Kharkov, or operations uh, directed at Chernihiv, or some of these areas that the uh, Russians uh, launched attacks early in the early phases of the conflict. It looks like the Russians are continuing to build up their forces near uh, areas such as Donetsk, Luhansk, and continuing to focus uh, on Bakhmut, Avdivka, areas near Solodar, while expanding operations near Zaporizhia, this area here. It does appear that there is an ongoing Russian operation designed to move north and seize control of this city here, Orakhiv or Orakhov, depending on which side of the fence you are setting. But the seizure of Orakhov would then allow the Russians to launch a two pronged offensive towards Zaporizhia. Uh, one uh, from this area here near the Dnepr Lake, uh, north towards a, a, a due north to south advance on Zaporizhia. And then also break the Ukrainian lines near Orokov and drive towards the eastern outskirts of Zaporizhia. That right now looks like what the Russians are building up to do. While at the same time, this is also going to serve as blunting any sort of Ukrainian counteroffensive designed to strike south towards a Melitopol. And I've discussed this before, that if we were to see a major Ukrainian offensive directed towards Melitopol, severing the land corridor to Crimea, uh, that would essentially uh, uh, ring the death bell for the Russian uh, invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. But the Russians right now appear to be looking to not allow that to happen. And that is why we are seeing this buildup north of Melitopol. We are seeing additional Russian forces being committed uh, 
to both defensive and offensive operations within the vicinity of uh, Orikov. And again, ultimately, the Russians right now appear to be focused on a offensive operation designed to threaten Zaporizhia and eliminate any possibility that the Ukrainians could launch this uh, much ballyhooed offensive operation south and cut the uh, cut the land corridor. Doesn't look like that's going to happen. That seems right now a uh, very very remote possibility. Meaning a Ukrainian offensive operation that seizes control of Melitopol, severs the land corridor, and uh, possibly allows the Ukrainians to threaten Crimea. Now at the same time, with that being said. While the Ukrainians aren't going to be in a position to sever the land corridor, again, it looks like the Russians are not going to be in any sort of position to launch major offensive operations uh, out of Belarus towards various targets in north-northwestern Ukraine at this point. It also appears that we're not seeing, or at least right now, the uh, developmental stages of operations for the Russians to launch new offensive operations south of Belgorod towards Kharkov. We still here at MFAM believe that Kharkov is still a military objective of the Russians. It's just not going to happen within the next four months. Uh, probably again late summer uh, at best at this point. Now, we also have heard that because we're not seeing this second round of mobilization, the official second round of Russian mobilization efforts uh, to include uh, the conscription of, of another 500,000 troops, that uh, that is going to disallow further Russian offensive operations. And I would have to say that while the Russians have not announced a further mobilization of another 500,000 troops. That does not mean mobilization efforts are not underway. I think initially when the, the Russians announced the 300,000 uh, a, a person uh, recruitment effort, that was the general mobilization order. And we, we still believe that uh, the Russians are continuing to mobilize, continuing to expand uh, its capability uh, to launch operations in Ukraine. And again, we do believe that by late summer 2023, the Russians are going to be in a much better position to launch operations, renew operations, against Ukraine, but not in the winter, not right now, and again, probably not uh, in the spring outside of operations that are happening south of, uh, of Zaporizhia. But ultimately, if we fast forward, we believe and still continue to believe that the ultimate Russian goal right now is to create conditions where the Russians are eventually able to seize all territory east of the Dnieper River at some point. And that would include the seizure of the second largest city in Ukraine, of Kharkov. But first, the Russians have to achieve initiative and success near Slovayansk, Kramatorsk, and at this point we believe the operations south of Zaporizhia are going, could be, could be the turning point for Russian operations in the Donbass. So again, if the Russians are successful at seizing control of Orikov or Ortikiv and are then able to pressure Zaporizhia and achieve some sort of breakout operation while they continue to strengthen its force construct north of Melitopol, the possibility again of a successful Russian breakout is, uh, is very much po uh, possible. 
We've heard a lot about, uh, we have seen a Norwegian uh, a, a general discuss that the Russians may have lost up to 180,000 troops. That's new coming across the wires. We don't know where he is getting that number at. And then when, when he's asked about Ukrainian casualties, he reports in excess of over 100,000 personnel. Now, you have to look at what is happening on the ground and the type of warfare that is taking place right now in eastern Ukraine and southern Ukraine to, uh, to try and uh, calculate casualty figures. We are not seeing massed Russian offensive operations that would create mass casualties for the Russians. The Russians right now are continuing to use lots of heavy artillery. They are continuing to use lots of air power or elements of their air force to include helicopter gunships and uh, strike aircraft to hit Ukrainian targets. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of what's being reported, especially coming out of Ukraine, about these casualty figures. And some of these daily casualty figures that are being reported by the Ukrainians are five to 600 Russian casualties, and, and all the Ukrainians report is just they are suffering one-tenth the casualties of Russian forces. So they are saying essentially that five to 600 Russians are either being killed or wounded. It's difficult to say what they're actually saying. Some say they're, that they're 500 to 600 Russian KIA. Some believe it's five to 600 Russian uh, KIA and wounded, while one-tenth or 50 to 60 Ukrainian soldiers killed or wounded in daily operations. That just doesn't make any sense considering what's happening on the battlefield. Given the amount of artillery that's being sent downrange by the Russians, given the amount of airstrikes that the Russians are conducting against Ukrainian targets, to include cruise missile strikes, these casualty figures just don't make a lot of sense in terms of the lowball numbers that the Ukrainians are reporting and the, uh, the, the, the very, very high numbers that the Ukrainians are reporting on the part of Russian forces. We would suspect that casualty figures are probably, at best, lean towards, right now, the Russians quite possibly suffering less casualties than the Ukrainians. And again, what I what I base that on is the Russian use of air power and the Russian use of a lot more heavy artillery and multiple launch rocket systems being fired downrange than what the Ukrainians are using. So at best, casualty figures are probably on par. Now, yes, uh, Operations that took place near uh, uh, Solodar, uh, where we saw those uh, infantry battles taking place near Solodar. Yes, the, in all probability, the Russians did take casualties near Solodar, as did the Ukrainian forces as well. But to say that the Russians are losing five to six hundred a day, and the and the Ukrainians are losing fifty to sixty, uh, at that point we can say the Ukrainians are over propagandizing the conflict, because in all probability, because again it's just not the uh, the front line where the Ukrainian forces are suffering casualties. It is rear areas as well that the Ukrainians are suffering, suffering casualties. These cruise missile strikes that the Russians are making with, with drones and cruise missiles, they're just not shooting at apartment blocks. Very few actual civilian apartment blocks 
have been hit by Russian cruise missiles. We say at this point, the vast majority of Russian cruise missile strikes have been on either infrastructure, critical infrastructure targets of the Ukrainians, or valid military targets. Look, the Ukrainian military exceeds 1 million personnel right now. These 1 million troops, in all probability, are being housed in other locales other than Ukrainian military bases. The Russians have hit most military bases in Ukraine. So to house Ukrainian forces, the Ukrainians are housing a lot of its forces in hotels in what were former civilian buildings that have been repurposed for military use. The Ukrainian army, the Ukrainian air force, Ukrainian air defense forces are not sleeping in sleeping bags in the field for the most part. They're not sleeping in tents in the field. Most of them, outside of the front line forces, are living in repurposed barracks, hotels, large buildings, just like we saw the Ukrainian strike on Russian targets against repurposed buildings. That recent strike against uh, that uh, repurposed building, that technical uh, college that was being used to house Russian troops that was hit successfully and quite possibly killed up to 100 Russian soldiers, the same is being done to Ukrainian forces with Russian cruise missiles. But uh, we're watching very closely uh, what is happening right now uh, south of Zaporizhia. Uh, the Russians could be making more headway than obviously what is being reported by mainstream media and, of course, the Ukrainian uh, media outlets as, uh, as well. And uh, we'll keep an eye on what's happening south of Zaporizhia as uh, in other areas of the conflict zone as, uh, as well. And we're still going to, uh, and we're still monitoring the uh, deployment and shipment of additional weapon systems to the Ukrainians. There is a lot of talk now about uh, deploying Western main battle tanks, Leopard 2s, uh, Challenger 2s, uh, even the possibility of uh, M1 uh, Abrams uh, to, to Ukraine. Uh, at this point, again, as we talked about in a, a prior video, uh, the West is going to have to ship a lot more than just a company-sized element of Western main battle tanks uh, for the ha to have this any impact on the conflict. Uh, right now, again, just this deployment of these few tanks is just simply for propaganda purposes only. But at the same time, it may open the way for a lot more Western equipment to the Ukrainians. Now, with that being said, we're hearing reports coming out of the Kremlin with senior Russian leadership officials basically saying they've just about have had enough of equipment being transferred to the Ukrainians. And, and the Estonians, the Estonians are getting very, very bold in terms of what they are doing and what they are saying. Uh, the uh, Russians have uh, kicked out the Estonian ambassador, and for some reason the map uh, is not wanting to show us Estonia. It just shows us Lithuania and, and has eliminated uh, Latvia and Estonia. Hmm. I wonder if that's a sign of things to happen. I'm going I'm to get some heat for that. But uh, I think the Estonians right now, both with the rhetoric and uh, with their force capabilities are putting themselves in a very precarious situation in terms of what they are doing and what they are saying. The Russians still have capabilities and that capability is growing. And the prospect that the Russians could move against Estonia, I would say at this point, you cannot rule out. 
if this if this war really gets out of hand and again it continues to move in that direction this war is not de-escalating it is continuing to escalate so again Estonia be careful because at this point again based on Estonia's actions the Russians could consider Estonia a hostile party. And it would be very difficult for NATO if a year from now, if six months from now, after this Russian mobilization is complete and the Russians decide to turn on Estonia, that's going to be a very difficult proposition for NATO to intervene. More to come very, very soon. Have a good day.